Courtesy of Brad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're five games into the season and the Calgary Flames have won four. A very impressive start. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to discuss that start. Matt, how often are we talking about this team up until Christmas losing a whole bunch of games? Yeah, it's weird that the Flames are off to such a hot start in October. Usually it's, you know, we're shooting for 500 and then hoping for the best in November. And that counting on that seven or eight game winning streak in December to reset exactly, the season. Exactly. Yeah. You kind of get that seven or eight game win streak at the first half and you're like, okay, we're back to 500 again. Life is good. Now let's do well in the second half. Yeah. And instead, uh, this year, it, this is actually, this season schedule would be more conducive to that kind of a start because the Flames are playing a lot of very good teams right off the hop this year, but they're off to a four and one start, which is one of the best starts in franchise history. Let's be fair. Not a four and one, a four Oh and one going by NHL, uh, NHL match. No, uh, doesn't the Sabres game count as just a regulation loss? Uh, Oh, you're right. Sorry. I was looking at the wrong team here. I was looking at Dallas's stats. Yeah. All right. So four and one, you're right. My bad. Um, Yeah. I was looking at the stats, had them in front of me, and and got Dallas and Calgary mixed up. So, yeah. All right. Well, let's let's jump in and talk about these. So uh, the Calgary Flames first game of the week played against the um, Vegas Golden Knights, and this is a game you and I were looking forward to. This is one of those games I think the team had to use a proving ground. And while Vegas not as good this year as in the past, this has been a team that stymied the Flames a lot in the past. Um, so the Flames ended up doing what they need to do and got the three to two win in this one. I don't know about you, but I thought the flames were on the, their heels for the first half of the first period. And it wasn't really until then that things started to really start going their way. Yeah. And it's a theme thus far this season with Jacob Markstrom, where he has not started the game on time. Um, like uh, pretty much like every game, the first goal that he has surrendered or the f- first and second goal that he's surrendered have been on the mediocre side and uh, it was evident in this game like the flames got down to nothing um fairly quickly and they were able to claw their way back in this one and collect the victory and held firm but it they did not do themselves any favors early in the game before settling down no and even outside that first half probably the least impressive first period we've seen from the flames so far and obviously you can't play 82 games you know 60 minutes every game but i guess the best thing here is the flames whatever they needed to do going into the second made some adjustments and looked a lot better yeah and there are going to be games where you couldn't make a pass to save your life um or a play to save your life and every team goes through games like that it's just uh when you're looking at the schedule there are certain teams and certain situations where like you need to be sharp right from the get-go and a game against vegas is one of the most important games in the season uh just because realistically the top four teams in our division are going to be calgary edmonton vegas and los angeles barring unusual weirdness um so that this is one of the teams that we're going to be fighting for a playoff spot against and you know while i think the flames are quite a bit better than vegas you also don't want to give them any opportunities to get a foothold near the top of the division and they started the season three and oh heading into this one and you know if calgary had lost this game like all of a sudden you know like you're already starting to have to make up multiple points just to catch up and you never want to get behind the eight ball no and i think even just that you know that proving game as we've talked about right the flames have not done well historically against this team so prove you can get the win against them yeah it's sort of like uh, when the flames finally beat the anaheim ducks in the honda center just getting that monkey off their back was enough to like now the flames basically win there most of the time since they broke that streak and if they can actually win a game for the first time ever in vegas later on in the season 
I think that'll go a long way to just making the Golden Knights another team in their head instead of the Boogeyman, which they've kind of been since they started. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, well, let's move on to the next game then, and this is the one I got confused by earlier. The Calgary Flames and the Buffalo Sabres played on October 20th here at the Dome, a game that you generally don't expect a lot from when that team's in town. But uh, Buffalo ended up beating the Flames handedly in a 6-3 Flames loss, and in this game, Noah Hannafin not on the ice either. Yeah, this I hate the Buffalo Sabres uh, games with the Flames just because... Traditionally, the Flames end up playing down to the Sabres level, and the games generally are very sloppy for the Flames. And Buffalo, up till this year, has not had any talent to really post any sort of comeback. And I do believe there have been a couple of games that have gone to overtime tied at zero between these teams. Like it, Usually these games are just bad. And this really wasn't any exception. For the first 40 minutes, the Flames were just completely outclassed by the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, I would say the first, I would even say the first period. I mean, Buffalo got up, you know, three goals early, and it just seemed like the Flames, not just, you know, the goaltender, but the Flames in general, just not ready to play. Yeah. And they, they did score one and they traded goals to make it 4-1 and then the weird goal late in the second period uh, where the referee accidentally stopped the puck for Jonathan Huberdeau to set up the, the goal scorer uh, Trevor Lewis but you know the Flames at that point like they were down two they could have had an opportunity in the third period uh, to come back, and they did score one early to draw within one, and it looked like everything was going to happen. And then a careless tripping penalty resulted in a goal against another one, um, and Calgary just looked as disjointed as they had all game, which up to that penalty being called, like the Flames were just mauling the Sabres in the third period. And it was like, okay, it's just a matter of time until Calgary ties it. And then once Buffalo re restored the two goal lead, like they just could not find a pass or a shot that was even dangerous. The rest of the way and then Alex Tuck scored the hat trick goal on an empty net and the flames fell in this one six to yeah, three I mean, even in the third right when Zadorov got that uh that f his first goal of the season that goal there that made it uh four three Buffalo you kind of felt like the flames could get back into it and then it was I think like four minutes later that Alec Tuck scored and at that point I just kind of felt like that's it yeah same here even though the flames kept battling you just kind of felt like with everything they went with, I don't know, it just felt like Buffalo was going to find a way to hold on. Yeah, and to be fair, like Calgary, uh, they uh, one of the problems that the teams had for the longest time is uh, when a situation where they're, they're needing to try and show some desperation, they end up trying too hard instead of making simple plays and just letting things develop organically. And the amount of panic that was in their game when it went down 5-3 just led to chaos on our side of the puck where like simple passes, simple breakouts, simple skating into open areas, like they just find a way to bobble the puck, miss the pass, skate in the wrong areas to not utilize their teammates effectively. And, and it just was bad and the, they in effect killed the clock for Buffalo rather than like Buffalo doing anything exceptional to keep the flames at bay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, uh, I think that's fair. And you know, I guess this is maybe the same story here in a way of the Vegas game, even though not the same result where the flames didn't look like they were ready to play came out but figured out a way to turn it around. I think the second period much better for the Flames. Um, I think even the third period a better period, even though I felt like by then, you know, their maybe spirits weren't there. But I felt like this is, you know, the Flames didn't come out to play. 
uh, right from the beginning, and and but in, in the end, we're able to change their game and modify their game to look a lot better. You know, in the second forty, and and, and then the or sorry, yeah, the second twenty, and then the last twenty, so the last forty of the game. Yeah, and the the one main difference between like this year's iteration of the flames and past ones is that we actually have four quality lines, and you can just roll them. Uh, where, like, even if you aren't feeling it, you have plenty of options throughout the lineup to throw out there. Even if you want to throw the lines into a blender to see if you can't find some other chemistry for the rest of that game or beyond. Um, like, this team has all of the weapons at their disposal that they could need. And it's just unfortunate that uh, the, the team couldn't find a way in this one to overcome their poor start. Well, they uh, didn't carry that poor start over to the next game, I would say. And if we take a look at the next game, the Calgary Flames played the last one of the week. The Calgary Flames ended up playing against one of the best teams in the East. And I think a game that not a lot of us were quite sure what to expect from as the Carolina Hurricane came to town and played the Flames on uh, Saturday night. And the Calgary Flames ended up getting a 3-2 to two win in this game in overtime. Yeah, this is another one of those instances where, uh, like, the two goals by Carolina were kind of sloppy goaltending from Markstrom on both. Um, like, uh, the first goal, Sebastian Ajo, he broke in on the defender, Hannafin, and uh, was able to put the puck between Markstrom's legs. And... Like Markstrom in the the instance with that particular play and how it all broke down, if he was playing with more confidence, uh, he probably would have either poke checked uh, the puck off of his uh, of Aho's stick, or would have utilized his stick in a manner as to block the five hole, because with where Hannafin was, like Aho did not have the time or space to flip the puck up in the air. Like he pretty much only had one play, which was to put it five hole. And it just looked like one of those where um, Markstrom was reacting too much to the play instead of being confident in his own game. And I think that was what led to that one. And then not resetting himself after getting bumped slightly and losing his goal stick. Uh, it was just a, a bit of a poor effort on the second goal. But to the Flames' credit, after going down 2 nothing, they started actually playing harder from that point forward. The Flames did not play a great game in this one. I think you know anyone who watched it could say that. But the fact they didn't play a great game and still managed to beat a top team in the league really says something about the makeup of this team. Like you were saying earlier, the four lines, the drive these guys have, like I think that by itself really says a lot about where the Flames are at. Yeah, and I have to say that was one heck of an unexpected sneaky play by Brett Ritchie on his equalizing goal. Because Ritchie is not known for his creativity offensively. And with the Flames player streaking across the ice on, uh, like... Auntie Ranta made the correct guess. The right read. Yeah, that like that that was going to be a clear pass across, and it was he, he Richie fooled everybody in the building on that shot. Like I, when I saw the play develop, I'm like, oh, that's going to be a pass across, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's in the net, and. You know, like, goalies have to cheat a little bit sometimes, and it you have to know, like, when to cheat and when not to. And, like, if you had, like, a more creative player like Manjapane or, you know, Huberdo, you would not have seen Ranta cheating off the post like that. But because it's Brett Ritchie, who's not known for his offensive creativity... You're not expecting him to fire one right at your hip uh, in hopes of a bank shot. Like, it, that just, it does not seem like in his wheelhouse. And he just caught him making a bad call, even though, like, he made the right read in the situation. He just, you know, it was unfortunate luck for Ranta, but props to Richie for one heck of a good play. 
Five games in the season, would you have expected that Brett Ritchie would be tied for second in goals on the Calgary Flames? Sure, why not? You know, like... Uh, uh. Tyler Toffoli's got three, and Kadri, Manjapani, Backlund, all names you expect to be there. Lindholm expect to be there. Brett Ritchie, not the guy you expect yeah, to sure. be there. Yeah, sure, you know, like last year it took him like 53 or 54 games to finally get off to the schneid. So sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> Gotta get the work done early. Not... not yeah, not the guy you'd expect to be up there. And then Michael Stone right behind him, tied yep. for third. Yet Huberto still zero goals. Well, that's kind of to be expected. Huberto's uh, very much a pass-first kind of guy. Uh, uh, think Alex Tange, but on steroids in terms of overall abilities. Yeah, but even Tange was was scoring at a, a fairly good True. clip. And Huberto well as well. It's just... Uh, he just needs time to figure out his line mates more than anything. So five games in the season, the Calgary Flames sit atop the Pacific Division, tied with Vegas for eight. I guess you could say they're on a pedestal. We'll talk about that a bit later. There's a tease for later in the game. I think everybody knows where we're going with that one. And uh, that puts them second in the West, right behind Dallas, who has nine points. The Flames five games in. Four wins, one loss, zero overtime. You you mean the Dallas Jake Ottingers? <laughs> there you go. Because really, that that's not a, a playoff caliber team, except for like a law firm Ottinger yeah, and Company. Except like that goalie Ottinger is and just Associates. awesome, and you know I I'm glad that we're not in the Central and don't have to face him in the playoffs most likely this year because he will the Stars will be one of the top three teams in that division. You have to figure if he plays like he did in the playoffs all year, uh, you know, Dallas is going to win a lot of games because of that. But with Dallas not having the support in front of him, I also have to worry if he's going to get burned out easy. And that's also a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But let's uh, let's talk about our goalie as opposed to Dallas' True. goalie, shall we? Well, you got to you got to give him a guy praise when he plays like that. Like, uh, you know, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, we can praise him, but uh, we can talk more about if he's going to burn out or make the playoffs down the road when it'll affect the Flames. Yep. So, Matt, uh, Jacob Markstrom, he has had some people online criticizing him. A lot of Flames pundits think it's too early to do so. He hasn't looked great this week. Are you concerned about Jacob Markstrom? Uh, a little, but not really. Like, how would you say? It would be one thing if he was struggling from the opening whistle to the end of the game and was, you know, not making good saves and was letting in the, the occasional uh, Brian Elliott like goal. Uh, but it, it, it seems that like for the first 10 minutes of the game in pretty much every game to start this year, he just has not been ready from the opening puck drop. And, you know, he was dealing with an illness and, I'm wondering if a bit of it is due to that, the, just the lingering getting better from whatever it is he had. Um, mental preparedness off the start of the game, but like when we saw him uh, in yesterday's game against Carolina, like he was bad for the first 10 minutes. But then like after that, he was making highlight reel saves one after another throughout the rest of the game and was the only reason why the flames got to overtime and you know it was a gutsy performance by him and like if we weren't seeing the flashes of that in his game then i'd be a little worried at this point and beginning to question whether or not vladar should get another couple of extra starts just to let markstrom figure out what's wrong but as of like right now, unless Markstrom like if, unless these struggles frankly continue until like the middle of November towards the end of November, um, I I would say just keep rolling Vladar once a week like they have been, and you know play it by ear from that point and wait and see because uh, if he can just iron out the first 10 minutes then he's basically himself from last year yeah i think a lot I, I think when your team is doing well there's always people that want to find something to complain about and i feel like people are making a mountain out of a molehill with jacob markstrom like you said he hasn't looked terrible he's maybe having bad starts to the games 
We know that he's been sick with something. We know that Hannafin was out for a day. I have to believe, and I've heard that there might be some uh, illness going through the Flames dressing room, so he's probably not feeling 100%. But this team is finding a way, I'd say, to work hard in front of him until he gets those first 20 minutes or even 10 minutes sorted out. And like you said, if it continues to be an issue, great. But I feel like this is something that's able to be worked out. This is not usually Jacob Markstrom. This isn't a pattern. This isn't like Jerome McGinley who doesn't turn on until Christmas that we know is coming. It's something new and something that I think is something that the, the goaltending staff here can work out with him. Yeah, it's one of those things that wins also help in situations like this where, yeah, he's struggling, but you know the team is 4-1 and one through five games. So like even though he's struggled, it hasn't really bit the team at all. And you know, if if you're looking at the schedule for the next couple of weeks, we have Pittsburgh and Edmonton coming up later this week. But then like in the beginning part of November, there are four or five games against some rather soft opponents. So uh like those are kind of more the games where you're gonna want Markstrom to figure things out by then and before we reset against more good teams towards the middle of November. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think, you know, the, fa- and it makes me wonder now, I mean, the fact that Daryl Sutter is wanting to put Vladar in more and we heard wants to put him in once a week. If maybe there's something that he knows there, maybe he knows that Marky's fighting something or something's there that we haven't been told about. It's one of those things that it's such a luxury to have, uh, Vladar on hand so that way you know with marks from if he falters like you you're not going to like Danny Taylor or Leland Irving or Henrik Carlson um like you have a legitimate quality second or goalie. even Oscar Dansk yeah like you have a legit uh, you know alternate and uh, you know like if marks from really struggles over the next little bit you could run vladar for two or three or four games in a row without it being a problem yep yeah no i totally agree with that um matt you mentioned dan vladar let's talk a bit about him uh dan vladar just got re-signed by the calgary flames he's on a league minimum deal that expires this year and just re-signed a two-year extension at 2.2 million per year I'll start with my thoughts on this before I pass it over to you. I think this is another instance of Brad Living showing what a wizard he is. I mean, if even if Mark, even if Ladar, who's 25 right now, I think doesn't get any better, I think 2.2 million is a fantastic contract for a reliable backlight backup at this. We have a 32 year old starter to have a 35 year or a 25 year old backup who can back him up at that price. Fantastic. Uh, cap allocation there. I think that Vladar is only going to go up. And by the end of that deal, he could be a great boon if we need to trade him at a great value. Yeah. And it's one of those things that the main criticism I've heard of this contract has nothing to do with Dan Vladar and, Oh, well, what are you going to do with Wolf on, on the farm? And that's a good problem to have. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh no, we have too many awesome goaltenders. Oh, oh no. <laughs> you know, like it really like Wolf, he is really young. He's only twenty one. Like him spending another year or two in the AHL and playing well down there will help him because you can see that sometimes guys get rushed to the NHL, especially in net and they struggle a bit because, you know, you're dealing with the best players in the world instead of, you know, a slightly lesser league in the AHL and they, it can ruin their confidence and they might not turn out. So if Wolf can continue to be Dustin Wolf down there, you know, having the the reliable safety of marks from Vladar for the next three seasons, including this one, you know, like at that point, Markstrom's only one year away from uh, free agency when uh, Vladar's contract ends. So it allows the Flames, if Vladar is looking like he's ready to take the next level and be a starter. Marks from on a one-year deal is suddenly appealing to a whole bunch of teams just looking for a good one-year 
rental basically and um then you have vladar and wolf at your avail for the that season and beyond and you know whether wolf or vladar takes over the net at that point you know it'll be on them but it's pretty much like perfectly managing timelines for everybody yeah, and I think that's really well said that, you know, it, it buys us time on Dustin Wolf. And while fans here, and I've been uh, doing the Shifts and Pucks podcast for the last couple of weeks, and we've talked a lot about this. Matt, you know that I'm really, really about keeping guys in the AHL maybe until they're over ready. And I think that even about goaltenders. And I, there's no reason to rush Wolf in there. And Flames fans, you know, often I think want to see these guys so they can see them playing. If you want to see him play, go to the Dome. Like, he's right there to go watch him play. Keep Wolf playing in the AHL to get starter minutes because he's going to develop a lot better playing starter minutes in the A than sitting on the bench and playing 26 games a year in the NHL. And it gives you, it lets you develop him properly and push that problem out. I mean, if we're looking at the 25 26 season and who our tandem is going to be at that point, um, you know, and we have to decide between Jacob Wolf, Daniel Vidar, and, um, and Dustin Wolf. We got a we we're in a pretty good spot at that point. Like you said, maybe there's a move to be made with Wolf. Maybe there's a move to be made with Vidar. Maybe at that point, I mean, let's be honest, maybe Wolf doesn't pan out and there's something to be done there. But I think, you know, you have to give yourself options, and that's what Tree's done here. Yeah, and that's also like with having the other guys like Chechalov and Arseniev in the system, like it gives other guys behind Wolf as well and everybody the time to develop because like look at how many people kind of penciled jacob peltier into the nhl lineup based off of him scoring so many goals last year in his rookie year and then he came into training camp and looked exceedingly mediocre and you know will he have a good season in the ahl probably and he'll probably be one of the two leading scorers on the team but you know, he need he needs that time to, you know, be a young player and learn from those on what it actually takes to get to the next level. And, you know, having Wolf literally just down the hallway from the NHL guys, he can go to the practices when he's not and take a look and see what the preparation models that all of those goalies need and their routines and like anything that he needs to improve and you know just the whole way that this yeah, and our and our goaltending staff can easily get to him and work with them yeah like it, the whole way this has been arranged by the team has been as close to a perfect way of handling that position as you can not every goalie can turn into a starter i mean i think we all thought maybe we'd get more from mason mcdonald or you know, Tyler Parsons, like even if we were to say, you know what, Dan Vladar's upside is a really good number two. And Wolf were to come in and, you know, supplant him as the number one at some point, you need a number one and number two or vice versa. If Wolf becomes a number one or sorry, uh, Vladar becomes a number one and Wolf becomes a number two, so be it. But you can't, not every goalie can be your Stanley Cup starter. So I think, you know, having two young guys there, it gives us, it lets us see who's going to be what. And I don't, I don't, I honestly don't think either one of them or necessarily both of them. I think one of them could become a really top end goaltender. I don't think both of them will be. No. And you know, sometimes teams do fall into that luck where like, uh, like Anaheim, when they had both Gibson and Anderson or Montreal with price and Halak or San Jose, when they had all four of Nabokov, Toskala, Kiprasov and Hedberg at one point. You know, that can happen, um, but, you know, it, it. that's also, like, why on our show for a number of years when discussing the draft, like I always say to draft, get another goalie every year until you get that Kiprasov level guy because you just don't know. Like, Wolf has, like, the pedigree right now, and all of the indications are is that he is going to be that level of guy. But... You know, there are other guys that have looked really good too and then flamed out. And yeah, you don't know or injuries yeah. happen. You don't know until you get there. Like Valimaki looked like a surefire top pairing defenseman and now he's a borderline NHL player and that just because injuries yeah. got in his way. And if nothing else, I mean goaltenders are a great currency. And so to have two young guys that if you have to make a move for one of them, 
you know that you'll be able to recoup great assets on that. So two two years, two point two million a year. I have no problem with that. I think for no. the I was actually expecting probably a higher contract on that, looking at what the Flames have paid the last couple of backups and other teams. I think that's a fantastic deal. Yeah, I agree. Like if you had said it was two seven five or three. But I would have been like, yeah, that that's about on. I would on have winced at three, but I would have said, ah, it's probably what it, what yeah. it has to cost us. Yeah, uh, market value ish, and sure, fine. Yeah. Well, the last piece of news before we get to maybe our main story of the week: uh, the Calgary Flames have announced their four alternate captains for this year. Obviously, not naming a captain to start with. Backlund, Tanev, Lindholm, and Huberto, the four alternate captains. So, Backlund, the longest serving flame on the team. Uh, Tanev, a league veteran, Lindholm, and Huberdeau. Any thoughts on those four guys being the on-ice leadership team? No, not really. Um, there's no surprising names on that list. No. Um, so, you know, would I be surprised if, uh, say, Huberdeau or Backlund was named captain down the road this season? No. But I am also would not be surprised if we didn't have a captain at all this year either. Yep. No, I, I am not surprised by any of those names. I think those are, you know, Backlund, very mature guy. Tana, very mature guy. Lindholm, very mature guy. Huberto. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great list. And who knows? I mean, that list may not be set in stone. They could even do, I think, who was in their early days, Columbus or Minnesota, switched their four alternates at Christmas time. So you might even see names switching out of that list. Yeah. I do believe that was Minnesota that did that. But. I think so. They didn't name a captain, but they had like eight alternates in one year because they did four and then another four. Yeah. Well, Matt, with that comes, I guess, our main discussion of the week. The Calgary Flames have, rever- have revealed their reverse retro jersey. And for those of us that were fans in the 90s, it's the black version of the 90s retro uh, retro sweater. The As we as Flames fans call it, the pedestal sweater. It's the one that had the uh, the lines going up towards the sea. Thoughts on this jersey? Uh it was kind of telegraphed that they were going in that route after Blasty. Um, What's well, it? You knew, okay, they have black pants now. They have a black helmet. They're going to have to do something black. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, I'm glad that they're keeping black in the Flames lexicon as a color, just because it, like, literally since uh, 94, 95, it, it's been a part of the logo in Jersey. So, um, with the pedestal jersey, like it, that, it it's on point for what that jersey was. Um, if you're a fan of the pedestal jersey, you probably love this redesign. A lot of fans around the NHL are like, "Oh my eyes, my eyes! What did you do?" Uh, <laughs> um, and like I've heard some uh, complaints saying it looks like a Walmart jersey, but you know that was kind of you know, it, it, yeah, that jersey was not very good back in the 90s either. I always like the arms on the jersey. Like, I like the diagonal stripes yeah. on the arms. I like the red going all the way down the arms. At the time, it was very different. Yeah, I agree. If they got rid of the actual pedestal itself and maybe, um, like, the yellow and white lines around the elbows, if they extended that through the interior part, I think that might have been a little bit of an improvement on the jersey overall, but yeah, it it kind of is what it is, and like you're either gonna love it or you're gonna hate it, and a, a good portion of people hate it, um, but there's enough that love it that I'm sure it will be sold out very quickly. I uh, they're only using it four times and all four in December. So if you're not a fan of it, like I'm not, I'll be first to say I'm not really a fan. I understand the gimmick, I understand why they're doing it. I'm not a fan. I hope it never comes back after this. I hope it was one of these neat jerseys that we do and that goes in the vault never to be seen again. But if you're, uh, if you are a fan, they're available now. If you're not a fan, they only have to wear them four times. No big deal. Yeah. And it'll be interesting. Like from uh, the middle of November through Christmas, the flames do not wear red at home, which is a bit weird, but, uh, you know, between wearing it. And this jersey's also made flames history. Do you know what the big history is here, man? No. First time we've ever had a white C on a black jersey for this team. Yeah, it makes sense. However, if I was doing this, I would have done the red C. I, I agree. That was like, my only dislike about that is that it doesn't have the red C. 
Yeah, like, and they might have thought it was too much red with the arms, but I would have, I would have done this one for something different because the flames I think are now known around the league by a lot of people for dark on dark. Like the black on red was very popular for a while, and I would have done dark on dark again for this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the red C on the on the black uh, jersey. Yeah, or you know they could have also flipped it where the arms were white and the logos red. Um, yeah, I think that'd be too much white. Though. Yeah, it, it. Yeah, like it, this. This jersey overall, like the original design and this one, are just a little too like all over the place a bit in certain ways, and you know that, the only it's not necessarily you knew it was a bad coming, thing though, though because they're they're trying to reach back into team history, and the Flames really don't have any other historical jerseys to to draw from. Yeah, it's like they could uh like pulled back the Atlanta Flames original jerseys or something like that. But But I don't think anybody in Calgary is going to buy a jersey with an A on the front. No. If I want if I was going to do it and if I wasn't worried about sales, because this is the 50th year of the Calgary Flames and Anna, and Atlanta Flames franchise, what I probably would have done is made a version of the Flames current home jersey, but instead of yellow, use that shiny gold fabric, the uh the Golden Knights use sort of for the the fiftieth anniversary, sort of like the Golden Anniversary idea, and go with something like that. But nobody's going to buy that. No, I know, and it, it's just yeah. Uh, how, how would you say Calgary's jersey history is just kind of vanilla and bland? Frankly, like the current setup for like the home and away jerseys, like. They're very plain, and even though like the, they look good, I'm not complaining about that. It, you know, like the, beyond the the original ones, though, like the O four ones were all right, but like every, every all the other, and that was literally only the uh, red home jersey for the O four era. Like all the other jerseys that the Flames have had have been like borderline awful. So yeah. it, it's one of those where, uh, you know, like there's really not a lot to draw from. And with like the Flames bringing like the Wranglers back, like there's not a lot of uh, Canadian or Calgary um, hockey history that hasn't already been tapped. You know, like unless they did like the original like Calgary Tigers, uh, the Ronald McDonald jersey, but in the actual colors of black and yellow. Like that, but that's again, about, gonna buy yeah, it. but like, that's basically the only other thing that you could do that's like Calgary historical without it being like one of our jerseys. Well, I'll tell you what I would do in just a sec, but just to point out here, a few things I really appreciate. And often when you see these kind of jerseys, they don't get all the fine points, right? And one thing I really like about this Jersey, the flames are going back to the italicized names and numbers on the back. So they're going back to the, the same font often we just see them use whatever name bar they're currently using or whatever font they're currently using to make things easy that's a lot of commitment to go back to a completely different font for four games yeah um i also like that they're actually using the the same pretty much the same pants as they had back then with the and i always thought those were cool pants sort of with the broken line stripe on them so i really appreciate kind of that commitment to it's the same one they're gonna wear the blasty jersey this year but the the 90s pants which were some of my favorite flames pants i agree you know what i would have done here matt if they would have asked me and of course they didn't if you wanted to go back to a time when i think the flames had the biggest uniform departure it was uh back in in the day when they brought in the blasty jersey the black blasty jersey i would have gone with the original blasty jersey or the red sea yeah, or even a white C. I think taking that O four black, you know, with the triangle look and put a C on it, I think would have sold quite well. Yeah, I agree. And I think like I remember if they back do... in the day in my NHL two thousand game, actually modifying that graphic, and I thought it was a pretty sharp jersey. Yeah, and it, that's one of those where like if the Flames have another reverse retro, I think you nailed what it will be it is the blast black blasty with a red C on it. Because we did pretty much see that same jersey given to us in white, yeah. right? We've never really seen it in, I mean, we've seen it in black, but not with a C on it. And that was really, that gave way to the to the black C on red. We've never seen a red C on black, and I'd like to see that. Yeah, and I think that if there is another reverse retro, I think you already nailed the concept there. Um, now, a question for you. Of all the teams in the NHL, 
seeing all of their reverse retro jerseys, who are your favorites and who are your, like, what were you thinking? Awful, <laughs> horrendous, my eyes, my oh, eyes. I have to pull them up again. I really like the LA Kings. Yeah. Um, I really like the Washington Capitals. Those are always my favorite Capitals jerseys, um, for, sort of from that Screaming Eagle era. And I always like the the Washington written in their striping. I like the Rangers. I've always liked Lady Liberty. Um, I'm questioning why Vegas wants glow in the dark jerseys. It's Vegas, like you know, you yeah. It it. I I love that uh, the Flyers are bringing back Cooperalls for the warm ups. I think that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Even though I don't like the jerseys, I agree. I think the Islanders went halfway. They brought back Captain Highliner, which I think is great. But remember back in the day, they actually had like the numbers offset to look like they were on a wave. Yeah, I know. They should have done the same thing. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, that you could tell that Lou Lamorello's in charge where he's like, yeah, we're not going to have like psychedelic, weird, wavy numbers and you know, lines on the team and the numbers being and weird. And I like Boston. I like the the white uh, Winnie the Pooh jersey. Yeah. My least favorite, St. Louis's, um, Florida's. Florida's really made me scratch my well, head. Well, like, Florida's, stupid... I, you know, to me, like my first instinct is, oh, that's a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey because you know they're at the beach and golfing. What, it, yeah, but know. that's it. Like it was always a dumb shoulder logo. Why do you want yeah. it in front of your jersey? Um, Toronto's, I didn't, I mean, there's really, Toronto's another team that doesn't have a lot of history, but, um, really, I, I don't see the point of that jersey. Yeah. And I'm not a huge fan of the shark seals. I understand what they're trying to do there, but I'm not a huge fan of the shark seals concept. Well, that one, you know, uh, where the, that was pretty much the only one that like really dipped back into like a different team's, uh, yeah. Era. Uh, the, yeah, the sort Rockies, of. I mean, Minnesota's like, Minnesota's does yeah, too. Yeah, the Rockies too with the uh, uh, the Avalanche, but it, you know, it, it's just uh, with the yeah. NHL changing jersey providers next year, and the fact that you can obviously tell by some of these we're running out of concepts. I think we're done with reverse retro. I I think there might be one or two more, um, just because I think I think they might go the way that baseball has and do more futuristic looking uniforms instead. Yeah, that could very well be. I think that there's enough for at least one more, like how uh, we mentioned with uh, doing the 04 era with the Red Sea instead of Blasty on it. Um, I, but I wonder if that might be something you just bring in as a third jersey at that point. And that very well could happen. Just like the black pedestal jersey, that might be the Flames' next third jersey if the sales are really strong. What are your favorites and least favorite reverse retros? Um, my absolute favorite one is the Robo Penguin. Um, I really like the lines on that one. I've always liked that logo. Yeah, same here. And, you know, like I know Penguins fans hate that logo uh, for whatever reason. I, I like the look and makeup of the Dallas Stars. Uh, they're like returned to the 93, 94 Dallas Stars uh, look. Um, the only thing to me is it looks like Dallas and Columbus are the same template, just different colors. Yeah. Um, very much, yeah. It's what I would love to see, even though it's not scheduled, is Detroit to play Chicago with their reverse retros, just because they're the same jersey twice over, and <laughs> you know, let's confuse everybody. Um, my other, yeah, and you you never get away with uh, red and black and red and black. Yeah, um, pretty much it. Um, Dallas and Pittsburgh are my two favorites. Uh, I really like the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, horrendous storm Jersey being having a white version, uh, just because that's awful in so many ways, sort of like the, what do you think about the Oilers bringing back the, uh, the oil drop? Uh, logo? yeah, that one's it's okay. Um, but again, run out of ideas. Yeah. Right? I like the, the, the coyotes went a little bit off the wall with their orange Jersey, even though it's ugly as all hell. <laughs> Uh, like I just, I feel like there's certain teams that have some gas left in the tank, but teams like the Flames, the Oilers, the Leafs are done. So I could see maybe some teams doing reverse retro, but not the whole league. Yeah, 
Uh, for teams that I think were badly done, um, Montreal's was rather bland. But again, only so many ways you can go. Yeah, um, Anaheim, like that really should be their primary jersey, not a reverse retro. Well, and we've been seeing them wear the old Mighty Ducks logo more and more, so it makes me wonder if they're going to go back to yeah, it. Yeah, um, New Jersey like, was... I think they moved away from it because they didn't have the rights to it. Now they've got them again, obviously. Yeah, New Jersey's was uninspiring. They just recolored their jerseys to match the Colorado yeah, Rockies. Dumb. It's like, cool. Which is funny because we have the Rockies colors on one and the Rockies logo on the yeah. other. And the Rockies colors on both of them, which, yeah, it, it, a little bizarre. Um, the rest of them, Ottawa's is, is very uninspired. Yeah. Too. Columbus, same thing. Nashville, same thing. Yeah. You know, Winnipeg, like a lot of the teams are just very, okay. That's a Jersey. Um, like last time there was about seven or eight that were like really top notch. And then like a couple that were like, okay, what are you doing? Uh, but like this time it's. Like, there's a couple that are above everybody else, and then it's, like, everybody else is in the meh middle. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. And, you know, when I look at these, there's always teams, like, even the Flames, right? They took their reverse retro and made it the third this year. And when I look at teams that might keep these around, I could see the Kraken keeping theirs around in the future as a third jersey. Yeah. I could maybe see the Coyotes keeping theirs around. I could see the Rangers keeping theirs around, and that's and maybe the the Islanders. But other than that, it just see, it feels like a bunch of novelty stuff. Yeah, I agree. And it, you know, it's like uh, the Rockies uh, thing. You know, it would be amusing, at, like if it was an outdoor game with Colorado versus New Jersey. Um, like that's about where the level of fit that those ones have. Like it, it yeah. It, yeah, it, it's just weird. And you'd think that, like, teams would consult each other, like, especially if they're using, like, different cities' colors in case, you know, they might duplicate. <laughs> well, I'm sure they did consult each other. Yeah, it's just, it just very they odd. They just to make sure those two teams aren't playing each other for those four games. True. I just feel like between the reverse retro program and the outdoor games, we there's been this kick in the NHL for a while of vintage, retro. And I think it's time to do something different. Yeah. And I think the, the original third jersey program in 97, I mean, we can criticize those jerseys for a lot of things, gave the league a very interesting new look with the, you know, the Winnie the Pooh jersey with the Burger King jersey. They were new and different. And even remember the, the um, Rangers just had, or the uh, Kings had just the gradient stripe. Like it was trying something different. And that's kind of what I'd like to see here. And it just feels like we've been, Stuck in the vintage mode for too long in the NHL. Yeah, and it, it'll be interesting to see where they go ahead from here. Because, uh, like, how would you say, like, sometimes, like, the jerseys, like, say, Tampa Bay's were just awful, or the Wild Wing jersey was just awful when they came out with them initially. But, you know, like, for every one of those, there are some good concepts that came out of it. Uh, like the Blasty template, even though the I'm not personally a fan of Blasty, that when they made the red version, oh yeah, of I, it, I love the jersey template. You know, like that was an awesome thing. Um, like there have been a few that have been a really good thing for the, the those teams, and you know, like uh, it seems that like everybody is just trying to do slightly different variations of other teams, but with their team's history instead. And it's just, it is getting a little boring. I totally agree. Well, it, it's sort of like how like uh, the Edmonton Oilers went back to their original jerseys. And then like a couple of years later, the flames returned to theirs. It like, that's fine. It's just, okay. Now what do you do? And so, so with this year's reverse retro, um, are you a fan enough of it to buy it? Uh, I did, um, just because I bought the other one. At You're kind of a Flames jersey completionist. A little bit. Um, I, I got a Fred Brathwaite just because, why not? <laughs> I love that. Number yeah. 40. The I feel like, I don't know, I kind of feel like you should be buying a guy who wears it. And I feel like, you know, if you want to go with the weird guy for this one, you buy a, a Dan Vladar. Yeah. Um. 
Or you can be my buddy Steve, who's probably the only guy out there rocking a Zadorov jersey in the dome. Well, how would you say with how uh, changeable the team has been lately with star players? Um, you know, it it made me a little more gun shy. Like I norm under normal circumstances, I probably would have got a Huberdo or a Kadri, um, just for you know, like star player. Why not? Uh, but, uh, you know, because of how everything's been, you know, for the last calendar year, um, going with a, you know, off the wall pick seemed more right in my head. So, and I, you know, Brathwaite and Aginla and Valerie Bure were my three favorite players on the team at the time. And, you know, uh, I don't, um, necessarily equate Aginla with that era of jersey as much as i do other eras i equate jerome more with the uh with the blasty and sort of that blasty template yeah the 04 template yeah. or the i mean for, jerome still wore number 24 back in the pedestal days you know when he first yeah came in. like uh, he didn't really get good until the blasty template came in yeah and uh, you know and like valerie Bure, he was there but like it uh, uh, it, he's not that good in my head uh, as, you know, and where Brathwaite, like, he was basically the guy during that stretch. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I hope you get your, your Fred Brathwaite jersey yep. soon. <laughs> so, Matt, just wrapping up here, we have a listener question here from a Flames fan down under, uh, Nick Brown from Australia. And he says, good day, gents. Your listener from down under, just wondering when was the last time you've been this optimistic about a flame season? So based on what we just talked about, let's do it by era. Was it, were you, have you been this optimistic during the pedestal era? Uh, no. <laughs> were you this optimistic before the pedestal era? Pre pedestal? Yeah, uh, that would pretty much be the last time. Uh, the 93, 94 season was the last time I was this optimistic. And not post pedestal. No. It's like, uh, you know, we that's how we start to, you know, it's like BC and AC in time. We should have uh, pre-pedestal and post-pedestal. Well, I guess they're both B BP and AP, before pedestal and after pedestal. Yeah. Or before young guns and after young guns. Yeah. and So, sorry, what year did you say was the last time you were the Uh 93-94. Um, the Flames, it, like, if they didn't lose to Vancouver in the first round, they'd probably go on to play the Rangers in the Stanley Cup Finals that year. And who knows, like they might have two cups if it wasn't for that series. So, you know, like they were that level of team and, you know, it was unfortunate that it didn't work out that year. And then things really started going off the rails with the team after that into the Young Guns era and haven't really recovered since then until now. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, that. And maybe that's another reason I'm against bringing the pedestal back. But it just felt like that was a that was a dark time for this organization. Yeah, like the team basically like was awesome and then slowly ripped itself apart piece by piece until Flurry got traded and then toiled for half a decade before an unexpected run, then kind of toiled for another like 15 years <laughs> until like this current iteration has started to emerge as one of the elite teams. And, you know, like it's taken 27 years for this team to get back to a level that they were before the pedestal. And, you know, like it, that's a clear delineation between the two eras and, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see, like, how this team shakes out at the end of the season. But, you know, looking at the first five games, for example, like, you can see that, like, not all of the new players have gelled with everybody yet. But you're starting to see, like, the first line starting to find some chemistry, um, especially in the latter half of the game against Carolina. And... You know, like if they those guys get rolling as well, like the you know, like if you can imagine like uh, the first line playing at a similar level to the Gaudreau line from last year, 
Like this team could literally be the best team in the NHL this season. And you know, that would be, you know, and it's, it's tough to break down. I mean, yes, we're five games in and it's tough to remember even what we thought of the team at the beginning of each of these seasons so long ago. But the last time I remember having anywhere near this much excitement anywhere during a season, um, was probably 18, 19 when the flames were first in the West, second in the league, first in the division, yeah. you know? So I think, I don't remember how I felt five games into that season, but just thinking back to seasons when I thought the flames could go on a really big run here is probably 18, 19. Yeah. I, I would agree with that for like a more modern, um, like there, how would you say that? Like there were still because of like previous years, uh, question marks of, uh, can Monaghan and Gaudreau lead this team, uh, and you know, Kachuk and, 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 um, which weren't really resolved and weren't until all of them got moved to other teams. Um, and it's one of those things that like, uh, this year in my mind, like there are less lingering questions about, um, the nature of the team itself. Uh, because like all the guys that remain, you, you know, exactly what those guys are and the new guys have enough of a pedigree that you know what they are too. And so uh, for sure. But I guess as a flames fan, I also look at, you know, like that year we were second in the league and we we're out in the first round. Like every time we think this team's going to do well, we get burned. So I think as a flames fan, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. I'm more optimistic uh, generally, um, this time because of the fact that, how would you say uh, the team, uh, over the last handful of years has had a little bit of an immaturity to them it, and it's subtle, but, um, it, it, they couldn't really find that extra gear. Um, and like, Everybody on the current iteration seems to have more of that businessman like mindset of, you know, just going out and doing their thing and being effective doing their thing. Um, like we've seen the fourth line grinder guys uh, draw like five or six penalties just by skating hard. And like there, there hasn't been like that attitude of following through that's been as pervasive. So that's why I'm a little more optimistic this time. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, and, and, you know, even in, again, it's tough to know where we were at, um, in 20, like it, it's tough to remember where we were at five games in and I'd have to go back and listen to those episodes, but I don't think we we're this optimistic no, five games in. Not at all. Well, uh, that, but when well, I look like, at, how do you say like the flames usually struggle out of the gate. And so like, you know, usually like a, with a, only a couple of examples uh, lately, have they even finished the, the month of October above 500? So like usually it's a, a huge question mark to start the year where this year, like they're basically first in their division, second in the West and in the top five overall, you know, like that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I I think the you know I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves though. No. Like uh, I like I said, I'm going into this with cautious optimism. We're five games in. We should have a great team. But how many times have you and I talked pre you know season start? This team looks good on paper, and then something happens. Yeah, and like how would you say that's been the function of this team over the last uh, handful of years? Um, like they acquired all the talent they needed to be an elite team. And like that was Tre Living's main goal was to get this team to be in, of an elite caliber of talent in the team. And then there were problems that became identifiable. Like the coaching staff was not up to par until they got Daryl. And they made the correct choice in getting a, you know, primetime coach to coach this team. And then okay, the team struggled under Daryl for various reasons. Well, what were they? Okay, it seems to have been a personnel issue. So, you know, like certain things happened with Gaudreau leaving that weren't in the Flames' hands. 
but other moves like moving Monahan and Kachuk out were in the Flames' uh, abilities to keep those players, but sure. instead opted to move that whole group out and start over and kind of like address the mini problem that you know and cycled out uh quality player for quality player but we're able to change the culture in the team solving that quote unquote problem and uh true living has been very good at like figuring out okay this is an organizational problem and let's deal with it and I think like this team has grown a lot over the last five, six, seven years, uh, where like the first goal was to get talented and th then it's now figure out how to actually translate that into being a consistent winning team. And thus far, it looks like they're on the, the right page for that, uh, that, that will also be the storyline that we'll be following until game one of the playoffs. So. And I think maybe another way to look at this, too, is this is the first year they seem to have clearly known who they were. In the past, it's like, are we a young upcoming team? Are we a veteran team vying for the playoffs? I think this is the first year we can really say, even going back to, you know, 18-19, I think this is really the first year we can say, this team knows they're in win-now mode, and they're ready to do yeah. that. Like, this, they, they are walking around uh, during the, their games, like, we know we're awesome you have to reckon with us, not, you know, the other way around. And like, there's just a little era of confidence in the team. Like even like how they've gone down to nothing a number of times and yet won most of those games. And, you know, like there's that era of, okay, yeah, we're down, but pff, you know, the rest of you guys are not very good. So we'll beat you anyway. And, just like Chumbawamba tub thumping. We get knocked down, we get back up again. You're never going to keep us yeah, down. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how this attitude, and like this is the kind of attitude that you've seen in the past from the LAs, from the Chicagos, from the Bostons, when they've been successful and like representing their, their team in the finals or winning the Stanley Cup. Like there's just that overall confidence in belief in themselves that, hasn't been there really since the early 90s or late 80s yeah. and that's the biggest uh change that i've noticed and um why i'm more optimistic about this team because they're not only talking the talk they are walking the walk and that's huge for this team when it comes to talking the talk and walking the walk, let's see if they can uh, do that this coming week. The Calgary Flames just finished up a three-game week, and they've got two coming up. Uh, another week all at the Cell Dome. Their second last week all at the Cell Dome. I guess not really, but I won't call Edmonton much of a road trip. But uh, two games of the Dome this week for this long home stand. On Tuesday, they play against the Pittsburgh Penguins, 7 p.m. start. And on the uh, 29th, on Friday, on Saturday, they play the Edmonton Oilers here. Um, uh, so two games. How do you think I'm they're going to do, go Matt? WW. So last week you thought they'd win Vegas, Buffalo, lose Carolina. So you had the right number of wins, just the wrong actual games. So you're going to go two wins yeah. this week. I want to go two wins. I so badly want to go two wins this week. And it pains me to make my prediction. I think they're going to win against Pittsburgh and lose against Edmonton. Uh, and, you know, for pains, all of our listeners... It pains me to go that way. Boo! <laughs> That's right. Um, it, it pains me to say a loss to Edmonton, but I just feel like... I don't know. Calgary has been, as we talked about earlier, they've been having some slumps lately. I don't know if Edmonton's going to be forgiving of that if they can't get things together. True. Well, Calgary, I think... I think uh, Pittsburgh, you might be able to get away with it, but I don't know you will against Edmonton. And let's be honest, there's only three games against the two teams. It makes it interesting if we win one, Edmonton one, wins one, and then we go into the third yeah. game. Well, uh, ideally, you know, the Flames will find a way to keep McDavid under wraps again. Uh, I thought that Kadri and Backland were both very effective in the game against the Oilers in the first one. Um 
at basically containing them to the, just the one power play goal. And if they can basically neutralize uh, Drysidle and McDavid five on five, then it's just a matter of trying to keep out of the penalty box and hope for the best. Because frankly, like the Oilers team, like beyond uh, those two, are not as good at, at, in a lot of ways. Uh, so. It'll be interesting to see. Um, that'll be my most uh, interesting game over the next few weeks, actually, because um, shortly after that, like the Flames are playing a lot of Eastern teams, so um, which is also interesting, but the, the intensity is certainly not the same. And as always, we ask you guys to submit your thoughts, your feedback, your questions like Nick did to us today. Uh, you can do it on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. You can do it on Facebook or FiresideChat.com or Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat on our website, FiresideChat.ca. You can send us an email through the website. You can also leave an audio message there. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're at Fireside Chat underscore podcast. Facebook, we are, we're Fireside Chat on there. Find us pretty much everywhere um, and let us know what you think. Let us know how you think this week's going to go. Let us know what you think of the Dan Vladar contract. Let us know if you're going to be buying a pedestal jersey. Um, you, you can be like Matt and get Brathwaite or Ed Ward or some guy we've forgotten about on your pedestal jersey and let us know what name you're going to get yeah. on there. Uh, you know, if uh, I was going to go a different direction, it would have might have been like uh, uh, German Titoff or, uh, you know, Flurry. Friend of the show, Kale Hulse. Possibly. Phil Housley. Yeah. German Titov would have been a good one. Val Bure would have been yeah. a good one. Actually, Bure didn't come until after that, so. I think he was right at the tail yeah. end of that. Um, but yeah, Titov would have been a good one. Nylander. Yeah, that would have worked as well. Um, Nat Dominicelli, uh, that might have worked. For off the ball, uh, Nat Domna Kelly, I th still think is the best Flames yeah. name, but we, we, can, we can talk about that another time. Zarley Zalapski, like there, there's plenty of interesting names if you wanted to go that route. Well, Matt, for, well, for, why don't we uh, take that discussion another week, and why don't you get us out of here for this well, week? Well, as always, go Flames, go, and Oilers suck. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.